Great. Uh... Hi, my name is Dan Wernergrad Court. I'm going to be talking to you about wormholes and introducing effects to functional reactive programming. This is work with my advisor, uh, Paul Kudak at Yale. So, uh, the context we're working in is functional reactive programming. It's about programming with uh, continuous values, streams of events, and it works like drawing a signal processing diagram. So, this is where Haskell really uh, is, is great because of the uh, error syntax that Haskell has. So, a signal processing diagram, you might have this um, box and pointer diagram, right? And the box is the signal function, and the, the, the lines are all the values streaming through your diagram. And in Haskell, we can, we can have code that's exactly this code, right? Uh, a signal function between uh, the arrow syntax to move the values through. Uh, so this has been used before in uh, Yampa for robotics, vision, animation, Nettle for networking, Utopia for sound synthesis, many other applications. These are just uh, particularly arrowized FRP. Uh, so when you go to use arrows, you can use that arrow syntax. It turns into these arrow combinators. Uh, so you can turn a pure Haskell function, f, into an arrow, into a signal function, but with the r uh, function. You can do partial application with first uh, composition and uh, even a, a looping where you feed back output back into the input. And the diagrams all look like this. Uh, pretty easy to follow with the pictures. So the question is, how can we perform effects in this model? If it's a, if it's a pure functional model, how can we kind of put in effects in a, in a safe way? And so we want to backtrack a little and ask, how do we do effects in Haskell in general? Right, so outside of FRP, we use monads. So for instance, we use the IO monad for general IO effects for real world devices. Uh, we can't escape from it, so you know, <laughs> we don't always want to be in it. It's not perfect for everything, but it is useful when you need it. Uh, if you do want to escape, you can use the ST monad, which is great for mutable data structures, where you can uh, make a data structure, do some stuff to it, and then escape the ST monad, monad afterwards. And we use this cool phantom type um, to prevent ourselves from making a mistake and accessing that data type, uh, that structure in the future where we weren't expecting to, and getting kind of weird results. Uh, so. IO and ST, these two moments are, are inherently different kinds of effects, right? As I said, IO is for these real world devices, for like a keyboard or for a speaker or printer. Uh, whereas the ST monad is much better for dynamically created uh, data structures. But the reason they're both monads is because monads give us this sequencing that's really great, that allows us to kind of structure out of the commands we're going to do. So, First, we'll start with how do we get that sequencing in uh, FRP? Uh, well, in, in normal Haskell, variables are, are fixed when you make them. And uh, in FRP, our variables, are, 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 our values are time varying, right? The, the streams update over time. So we can actually use that. Um, uh, we can have the same kind of sequencing that the monads provide in, in one context with the ordering of events of a stream in FRP. So, for example, we could have a keyboard, right? And um, it's just a signal function that has uh, an output stream of keystroke events. Uh, and that's great. The problem here is we need to make sure that output stream is unique, right? If you had two keyboard signal functions in your program, then that'd be really weird. Um, <laughs> because you'd have uh, two sets of streams, and really you want a unique ordering of your events. So we need to make sure they're unique. We use something called resource types. Uh, we brought this up in previous work. The point for now is that resource types guarantee that if you have two of these signal functions with the same type, both tagged as being your keyboard, then no matter what you do composing and manipulating your signal functions, you can be sure that they won't both be in the same program. That means that for any given resource, you'll have a unique stream. Uh, for mutable data, it's uh, a little different. We we'll model more like the ST monad. So you can have a function SF or write, and it would have an input stream, which would be requests like do this update or read from this cell. And the output responses might be out of bounds errors or uh, the values there or some sort of act that it completed properly. Uh, and these are cool because uh, unlike the keyboard, which is kind of unique, there's one keyboard in the physical world and one in your program, you can make as, put as many of these boxes in your diagram as you want, as many of these SF arrays in your program, and each one is unique. Each input and output stream is kind of just for that array. So you don't need resource types or any phantom types, it just works. 
Uh, we can look at an even simpler example, right? What if it's just one cell of memory? So um, you have an input stream that says um, what's going to be in this uh, cell next time, and you have an output stream, which is what was just there. Uh, so anyone who's done FRP might realize this is a delay, and we call it init because of uh, Lewidall's causal commutative errors, where he kind of talks about the idea of delay and uh, organizes it all together. Uh, but I look at this and think this is still complicated. Right? It's still doing two things. What if we could still split it apart even more? Uh, well, we have this weird structure that I call a wormhole. Right? We have one end where we write to, we call that the black hole because it takes in all the data, and the other end where we read from, the white hole that produces data. And I use this yellow-orange line to connect them because uh, it's not actually through types. This is through some sort of mutation going on behind the scenes. So it's not a typical red line, it's a funky yellow line. Uh, so why would you want wormholes? Well, they can be used as non-local communication channels. So say we have some two signal functions you know, built of composed signal functions internally. We decide, for some reason, we want them to communicate. We want SF2 to talk to SF1 here. Well, ordinarily, this is what we have to do. We have to do all sorts of partial application, change the types of our signal functions, which is a pain, maybe other things we're relying on, SF1 and SF2. Uh, we really don't want to do that. But wormholes with their little yellow connector allow us to do something kind of neat. We can connect these two signal functions without messing with the type, um, just by sticking in a wormhole between them. So in Haskell, right, to, to just give you a parallel here, the code would look a little like this. We have, you know, we introduce our error syntax, we read from a white hole in one, and we write from a black hole in the other, and they're connected, even though it's two separate signal functions, and we've never kind of uh, connected them by types or by composition. Uh, so you can ask another question. Why am I always using the black hole first? Well, I don't have to, right? I could swap these around, and if I just connected them, it'd be a little silly. It wouldn't do anything. But if I inject a function in there, then essentially I've created something like a loop. Right? I can write values into the black hole and read them out from the white hole. And that's kind of neat. This is the looping structure we saw earlier when I showed the various error combinators. Uh, so before we go further though, we need to realize that wormholes are these two interconnected signal functions. And that makes them a little more complicated than init itself was. Right? They have to be used together safely. We're more restricted than with init or SF array because you can't just have a wormhole and have a stream coming out of either end. You actually have two things, and you can only use them once in any part of your program, right? A lot like what we used resource types before. So just like as the ST monad has its phantom types, once again, we're going to use resource types. And now you can make a white hole and a black hole. They can be connected, but you can also be sure that their event streams are unique by using resource types. Uh, so one key thing here is that the execution order of this wormhole really matters, whether you uh, read from the white hole and then write to the black hole, or vice versa. So what we say is um, the white hole, the, the reads are going to happen kind of during the signal function execution, and the writes are going to happen afterwards. And in this way, the reads will always have causal data. They're always going to have data that comes from the past. It can never be that during one run through, we've written and then immediately read from it. And this is actually really nice, this causal connection, because it allows us to create the loops that I had that are, are causal. Uh, so we have this new loop primitive now. We don't need loop predefined, we can make it with wormholes. And uh, th these loops are actually semantically slightly different because they're causal, but that means they won't diverge. The data that you get uh, as input is always from the past, so you never have kind of a lockup there. You'll always be able to process these. And uh, the divergence will only ever possibly happen through time as the signal function progresses forward in time. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Uh, so we also go on to provide a formal semantics and proofs of correctness of so the semantics as well as the resource types and making sure that they do what they're supposed to. Uh, and so I'm going to go into that a little bit now. So the language specification we use uh, has these resource types, these resources, as uh, central to the abstract syntax of the language. They're not expressions. They're not actually exactly types for our semantics. They're a little different. Uh, they're, they're a new thing. They can be used in both expressions and types, uh, but only in limited ways in both of them. Uh, so the type of a signal function becomes this. This would be a signal function from alpha to beta with resources R that it uses. 
Uh, so we add to our you know, sample little piece of uh, pure Haskell some arrow stuff like we had before, our first and compose, we don't need loop. And we also add resource interaction, uh, which will be the expression that uses a resource, and wormhole introduction, which will introduce two new resources for a, a, an inner body. So resource interaction, you have to think of the resource as the essence of the effectful computation. So RSF is an expression that concretizes a resource into a signal function. So the keyboard example from earlier would be written in uh, error code like so. It, you take this keyboard resource and you concretize it into a signal function, which then you can use as a keystroke events coming out one end and a uh, you know, unit stream going in the other. This keyboard resource is the abstract representation. We can't use it in an expression until we concretize it with RSF. Uh, wormholes is the only typing rule I'll show. Um, the, the, the key thing here is that they, they use the, the, the phantom type trick um, that the ST monad uses. And so the wormhole resources only exist in the body, right? So you have uh, a body, E, that um, is a single function of type alpha to beta with a resource type set, resource set R prime. And in your output, you don't have access to the white hole and black hole resource types. So they can be used in the body, but then they kind of disappear from our view, and the wormhole is totally self-contained there. It's really you know, useful. Uh, so now we can go back and define some of the things we talked about earlier. In it is just a wormhole that kind of plugs its black hole right into the white hole. Now I'm using the uh, arrow combinators, which we use for our semantics. And the, the loop, similarly, is a wormhole that basically plugs its white hole through a signal function and into the black hole. There's some extra piping with R, but it's not really important. Um, and so, so then we can talk about the program execution. So what happens when you have all of these things running around? Well, we have three transitions that are used. There's this evaluation transition, which uh, everyone has a good idea of. It's for the pure Haskell code, and it just kind of evaluates the lambdas and stuff. Uh, you have the functional transition, which is for when you, when you have these signal functions and you have va instantaneous values on the street for one particular moment in time what happens. And lastly, we have a temporal transition, which is a um, uh, time-based resource interaction. Uh, so it kind of says, well, how does this program, how do the resources and the wormholes and everything evolve over time? Uh, and that's the most interesting one, and I'm just going to go into it uh, for a little bit. It's also kind of the top-level one that calls the functional and the evaluation ones. So the temporal transition starts by gathering data from the resources and wormholes, right? It collects anything from the keyboard or a wormhole in this example and sends it to wherever that resource is being used, or you know, the white hole where the, the, worm, uh, the wormhole's white hole resource is being used. And then it applies the functional transition, which runs through the signal function with those you know, seeded values. And at the end, it returns the data back to the resources and tracks the upkeep of the uh, wormholes. So it ends up doing kind of the I.O. stuff, the between-time stuff. Uh, so this is the, the transition rule for it. Th those three lines that I have actually map pretty well to the, the four preconditions. Then we can see as the output, we have a resource set R, wormhole data W, and program P. And they just kind of get updated over time. So as we run this program, the trace is just this transition over and over again. Uh, so we, with these semantics, uh, we can prove uh, the safety theorem that um, it's actually really important to our previous work also because I never proved it there. But basically what I can say is if a program P uh, has type alpha to beta with a resource type, uh, resource set R, then P will interact only with the resources in R and for each resource it interacts with, it does so at most once per time step. So what this means is that uh, resource event streams are guaranteed unique, which is exactly what we wanted and what we said we wanted at the beginning. And also we can look at the type of a signal function and know exactly what it interacts with. We know exactly which real resources it touches. And that means that we can look at one signal function that touches keyboard and another that touches uh, speaker and uh, compose them together without fear of, of uh, any problems. Uh, so the Haskell implementation is um, a little different from the semantics that we present. Uh, RSF is a logical construct and it doesn't really work as well as we want to in Haskell because the resources need to be both type and expression things. So what we do is we restrict ourselves to um, make resources only at the type level. And any time we would have a, uh, a signal function that has you know, a resource, we make it be a, a singleton resource that goes along with a predefined signal function. 
Uh, so, for example, the keyboard would just be built in as a signal function from unit to uh, keystroke events. Uh, the wormholes, uh, this is our, our proposal for how wormholes would work. Uh, instead of generating two uh, resources, it would instead um, be a function that takes two signal functions, the, representing the white hole and the black hole, one with the resource you know, for the white hole and one for the black hole, and then produces uh, the signal function that may use them, but then the output at the end doesn't use them. So just like in the typing rule before, these are the key parts, right? That the inner thing is allowed to use the two resources, and the outer thing doesn't have them anymore because of, say, a type class set diff. Uh, in practice, set diff has been problematic, so we don't have a, a working implementation of this yet. And there are a couple other approaches that we're also uh, looking into, but this seemed the most promising. We just don't have it quite working. Uh, so, in conclusion, the the idea behind wormholes, um, uh, one of the central ideas behind wormholes is that the execution order matters. That you need to do um, the uh, white holes during the time step and the black holes afterwards, so that you can get this causal connection. And that causal connection can let you make these uh, causal loops, and that um, that provides a lot of power. Uh, and we provide a formal specification of our language to facilitate proving its correctness, and we have those proofs in the paper. And even, we actually introduced wormholes in a previous paper as kind of a side thing, and here we expand on that. We uh, improve the design to make them easier to use and um, uh, uh, safer, to, uh, easier to reason about. So, thank you.